Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to be sober, and... I want to thank the committee and anybody who made it possible for me to stand behind the podium here tonight. I know these things don't come together by accident, so I appreciate all the hard work and service that went in tonight. And like Mike's saying there about meeting all those years ago, <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the few places in the world that you can walk in the room full of strangers and start reminiscing, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, we mightn't have stood next to each other at the bar drinking, but we understand, you know, terror, frustration, bewilderment, and despair. We've all been there, you know. We're sitting here sober tonight. I absolutely love Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I would just like to tell you a couple of, I see a lot of young people here, so maybe you get a kick out of this, a couple of jokes I often tell. There's a guy who is like 90 days sober, and he's talking to a sponsor, and the sponsor says, now just think where you were just 90 days ago. And the guy says, well, actually, I was sitting in a hot tub, half drunk, surrounded by beautiful women in bikinis. And the sponsor says, isn't it wonderful that you don't have to live like that anymore today, you know? (laughs) So maybe you're thinking, is this it, you know? And uh, But believe me, this is the last thing I tried, the first thing I ever worked. I absolutely love alcoholics and always. I love being sober. And I know we have some people here tonight who are non-alcoholics or perhaps members of Al-Anon. Perhaps you'll get a kick out of this. There's a, there's a sober man, and he's out on a blind date with a social drinker. And uh, he's have, having dinner, and she's having a glass of wine. He's having a glass of water. She says, I notice you don't drink. He says, no, I don't drink. She says, not at all. He says, not at all. She goes, not even one sip. He says, not even one sip. She goes, what would happen if you took a sip of my wine? He says, well, just imagine you wake up. You don't know what day it is. You don't know what time it is. You got one shoe on, your car keys are gone, your car's gone, your phone's gone. You're totally disheveled and totally disorientated. She says, that would happen to you if you took one drink. He says, no, it happened to you if I took one drink, you know. (laughs) And you think that's funny, you're probably an alcoholic, you know, and uh, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, I drove down here today and I called my sponsor. I always call my sponsor and he's like, uh, he says, where are you? I said, I'm going to drive to Maryland. He says, oh, you're going all the way to Maryland to speak? How far would you go to listen? You know, and uh, <laughs> I'm like, you know, they really need me. My sponsor is an old time sober guy. He thinks like being regarded as a good speaker in AA is like being the, the tallest of the seven dwarfs, you know, and uh, <laughs> I have a like cachet in here, but not too much out there. But on the drive down here, I was reminded of something happened to me recently. I'm at a meeting, and this guy came up to me, and he goes, Are you Paul McHugh? Uh, normally, when I was drinking, I'd, I'd avoided that question. But now that I'm sober, I says, Yes, I am. He goes, I just want you to know that you saved my life. So my very shallow self-esteem starts to perk up, you know, and I, I says, Pray tell, go ahead. The floor, the floor is yours. He goes. He said, I was on a long car journey, and my wife and my mother-in-law were in the back of the car, and they were arguing and bickering incessantly. I couldn't take it anymore. He said, I always have some CDs in the glove box. I opened the glove box. I took out a CD just to grab the first one, stuck it in. It was you speaking. Now this is what I think he's going to say. I thought he was going to say, and immediately the car was filled with a sense of serenity <laughs> and peace and understanding and goodwill to all man. But what he did say was, I put the CD in, 10 minutes later I looked around, my wife and my mother-in-law were fast asleep. <laughs> he goes, thank you very much, you know, and I'm like, don't mention it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit how it was, what happened and how it is tonight, and hopefully by about 11 o'clock I should wrap it all up. And uh, We're sitting here today in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know, we're just thinking there, we're talking earlier on about the convention and thinking about 
almost like the, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, because on June 10th, our birthday was just recently, 80 years ago, Bill Wilson had that divine thought. I wonder if I can stop drinking by trying to help another man stop drinking. The turning point in all our lives. I have the good fortune, talking to Ken. I've been back in Ohio, stood in that actually room where they met each other for the first time. And it sort of had such an effect on me because they were telling us, and it's so indicative of alcoholics and almonds. Bill Wilson didn't say, you know, I haven't drank in six months, Mr. Smith, and you should do this, and you should do this, and you should do this. He said, I haven't drank in six months, and that's, this is what I did. We'd rather see a sermon than hear one. And the beauty of alcoholics and almonds, those two people, one alcoholic helping another. And we can trace this moment in time back to that moment in time. I could stop drinking, but I couldn't stay stopped. This is the last thing I tried, and the first thing ever worked. And perhaps you're sitting out there tonight, and you're saying to yourself, Paul, I'm not, don't know if you can see my face, I'm not laughing. I backed myself into a corner I can't get out of. I'm in a trap I can't spring. Would you hear that saying, you go 10 miles into the forest, you got to go 10 miles out? I don't believe that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't care how deep and how dark and how painful that force you're in might appear to be. As far as I'm concerned, Alcoholics Anonymous tells me, and I tell you, that you're just 12 steps away from a new life. That's all. 12 steps away from a brand new life. Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the few places in the world where you get the ability to live two lives in one lifetime. Don't get me wrong, that guy that drank himself half to death didn't move away. He's still here. I believe because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, that obsession to drink, that idea that crowds out all other ideas is placed under spiritual lock and key in the subconscious of my mind today. But I realize, I've been around Alcoholics Anonymous, that it's a reprieve, not a pardon. And the only way that I coast in Alcoholics Anonymous is downhill. I've seen people drink again in a day that I thought would never drink again. And that tells me there's certain things I must do on a daily basis to enjoy this way of life. I remember one time being in Las Vegas, and I don't gamble, but I like to watch. And uh, <laughs> the guys are playing high stakes, Texas Hold'em. Maybe you've seen it on TV, and the guy stood up and he pushed all his chips in, and he said, I'm all in. I thought, what a great metaphor for alcoholics anonymous. I got to be all in, and I got to be all in every day. I tried the A, uh, hokey cokey, put your left foot in, put your left foot out. And maybe you're new here tonight and you're saying, Paul, these steps and traditions that were just read, they seem like a foreign concept. We have slogans in Alcoholics Anonymous. They were like the banisters to the steps. Easy does it. Live and let live, one day at a time. We have a symbol in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a triangle inside a circle. Perhaps you've seen it, and there's three parts to it. Unity, service, and recovery. And I believe this, and I believe it so much that I bet my life on a daily basis. I believe if you're new here tonight, or maybe not new, I believe you can put all three parts of that triangle into your life from your very first meeting. The unity. We do together what I can't do alone. Many meetings make it easy, few make it hard, none make it impossible. I've got to be a part of AA rather than apart from AA. Service, I heard one of our speakers who passed away used to say, the highest pay grade in Alcoholics Anonymous is servant. Why? Because I'm shackled to self. By the very biochemistry of this disease, I am shackled to self. My holy trinity is always me, me, me. So I had to learn to function for the well-being of another person besides myself, and I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. You put away one more chair than the one you sat on, you're doing service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I learned to serve in here so I could serve out there. I learned to love in here so I could love out there. Recovery. Maybe the 12 steps seem like a foreign concept. I say we have those slogans. Now I'm here to tell you tonight, not in the theoretical, but in the purely pragmatic in my own life, you can stay dry on two parts of the triangle. I've done it. You might even stay dry on one part of the triangle. I've done that too. But if you want to get what's on offer here, 
If you want to get free from the one guy you couldn't get free from, which was me. If I wanted to live in the one place I never lived, which is right here, right now, I had to put all three parts of that triangle into my life, and I got to do it every day. This program took this hopeless alcoholic from a place of powerlessness, not to a place where I'm powerful, that's just ego, but a place where I have access to power. You took me from the problem in step one through to step 12. And I realize tonight, if you're new here tonight, that sobriety is a journey, not a destination, that it's a process, not an event. And I accept that about myself tonight. I'm as powerless over alcohol tonight as I've ever been in any time in my life. I realize tonight I've been an alcoholic synonymous since August of 1992, but I respect tonight. I know tonight, one drink tonight, destination unknown. I got a body that won't let me drink and a mind that won't let me stop. I'm powerless over alcohol. When I controlled my drink and I couldn't enjoy it, and when I enjoyed my drink and I couldn't control it, and that's what separates me from the normal heavy drinker. I tried many ways of stopping drinking, but I couldn't stay stopped. As I said, use people. You think your blackouts had ended when you came to Alcoholics Anonymous? Maybe not. The good news is I stayed. I didn't run away when the lights went out, you know. <laughs> they don't like me. I'm out of here. But, um, and that's what separates me from the normal heavy drinker. You know, I used to get all that mental gymnastics when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Why did I become an alcoholic? Where did I become an alcoholic? When did I become an alcoholic? You know the old alcoholic conundrum, what came first, the chicken or the keg, you know, and... Uh, there's a few guys that got drunk trying to figure that one out. I just accept the fact that I'm an alcoholic. Today. Everything I knew, need to know, I found out in AA. My name is Paul, and I'm an alcoholic. That tells me who I am, what I am, where I am, and what I need to be doing. And if I do that, I'm all right. And when I'm all right, everything around me is all right too, even if it's not. Used people help me to come to terms with my past so I could live in the present for the future, which is the rest of today. But if I was to speculate, I know it may come as a shock to some people here tonight, but I'm not from the neighborhood originally. <laughs> Don't worry, for those who haven't got the hooked on phonic shamrock app on their phone, I will talk nice and slow. I it's about 27 years say, since I left my native Cuba, and, uh, you know. <laughs> I grew up outside of, outside of Belfast in Northern Ireland, the sort of neighborhood I came from, if you didn't drink, you moved. Everybody drank. It wasn't like, oh, that's what alcohol does. I seen alcohol up close and personal. And I used to look at my family tree, and my, my family tree, it's a bit like Eugene O'Neill's long day's journey into night. There's alcoholism on one side of the family and mental illness on the other side of the family. I mean, I didn't hear a point any fingers, but when I took my first breath, I blew a point to it, you know, and uh, <laughs> I could have been taken from the delivery room right to the AA room, you know. You see that newcomer in the bassinet? Give him a white chip, you know, and uh, make sure he doesn't swallow it, you know. All I know, there's been two turning points in my life. Real demarcation points that you can look back at my life. First night I took a drink. First night I walked into AA. Looking back on it now, I was looking for the same thing. Carl Jung, the, 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 the psychoanalyst who helped Bill Wilson, characterized alcoholism as a low-grade spiritual thirst. I was looking for something. For whatever reason, I don't care anymore. I ended up with a hole in my soul. And I tried to fill it with booze and people and places and things. And I had some symbolic victories along the way, but nothing of any permanence. And my life was characterized by, like, oh, this is it. No, that's not it either. And you're thinking, oh, this over-the-rainbow type philosophy. 
But I remember that demarcation point when I took that first drink. You've heard the metaphors, black and white, the color. I mean, it was just like this, one drink. I could be everything I thought you wanted me to be. And for a chronic people pleaser with low self-esteem, it was a magic elixir. Booze did for me what I couldn't do for myself. It worked. The problem is it stopped working. It worked, took all the rough edges off, made me be everything you wanted me to be. I thought to myself, but looking back on it now, it was a Faustian bargain. I made a deal with the devil. It says in our book, John Barleycorn aptly called the devil himself. If you'd have told me, and the merchant of Venice, Shylock wanted just one pound of flesh, not this disease. It'll give you a lift. But as it says in the literature, a rebacious creditor, and that's putting it madly. If you'd have told me when I took that first drink at 14 or 15 years of age, if you'd have told me, if you'd have come along like, say, for instance, Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol and the ghost of my alcoholic future had to come along and said, I want to show you something. I want to show you you in 15 years. Look through that window. You see that guy drinking around the clock against his own will? You see that guy that's pushed away everybody who mattered in his life at all? You see that guy who has quicksand stretched all around him? That's you in 15 years. I'd have said, no way. You must be thinking about somebody else. Not this guy. I can handle it. I can, this is, this is working for me. But that's where I ended up. I would not have believed where this disease, alcoholism, took me in 15 short years. But the good news is, standing here tonight, and if you're new, I'm not going to stand up here like some snake oil salesman and promise you the moon and the stars. There's things I lost through drinking, and they're not coming back. There's things you lost through drinking, they're not coming back either. But thank God for this program. Who among us could live with the guilt and the shame and the remorse of our drinking if it wasn't for the 12 steps to alleviate that. I wasn't a sociopath. I knew the bridges I burned, the doors I slammed, the people I walked away from. The sad thing about this, this disease is by the time you're actually graveyard dead, you've been dead mentally, spiritually, and emotionally for years. And everybody that mattered half a damn in your life is long gone. People here in Allen on tonight, a fine program will tell you. That's what they told me. Go away and drink or go away and don't drink. But you must leave our lives because that's what we do. Or I should say that's what I do. I squeeze and I squeeze and I squeeze till there's nothing left. If you're unfortunate to be caught in that sphere of negative influence, you're going down with the ship. That's the nature of doing business with an active alcoholic like me. Thank God for those steps. That's why I realize here tonight, we don't do these steps because they're nice. We do them because they're necessary for recovery. If I want to get physically and mentally and spiritually and emotionally rehabilitated, I have to work this program. I've tried every other way of getting the vital spiritual experience without doing the steps. Nothing worked. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know very much money when I got here. I was two and a half years sober. I was thousands upon thousands of dollars in debt. And I know why today. I was still trying to fill the hole in my soul. There's not enough stuff out there. I take a trip to the Caribbean, put it on my credit card, come home, feel good for a couple of days. But like a dear friend of mine says, always back at the same equation, me on me. Can't get me off of me. The man in the glass. The guy that I got to be with 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is a person I don't really like. And this was in sobriety. But you couldn't have told me all this back as a drinking back in, in Northern Ireland. But it's funny. Our life is, I was just thinking about this the other day, when Bill Wilson, there's points in our life, perhaps you've had a few of them yourself. Like Bill Wilson sitting at that gravestone in Winchester Cathedral when he read that doggerel. And he had a moment, but he shrugged it off. <laughs> Boy, drank for 15 more years after that, 15 hard more years. I remember sitting in a bar one time. I'm sitting in bars at 18 or 19 years of age. The next oldest guy in the bar is probably 25 years older in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the week. And I'm sitting there and I'm pouring a drink. 
Back then, I wasn't fashionable to drink out of a beer bottle. I'm pouring a drink, and my hands are shaking so bad. And there's a guy down the bar. There's a mirror, and there's a guy down the bar can see this. And this guy's like a half a wino himself. In fact, if the owner of the bar might have been there, he might have told him to, to sling his hook. And he came down, and he put his hand on my shoulder. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And he says, Paul, you can tell me to mind my own business, but that's some shake in your hand you have for a young fellow your age. I was like, oh, bad night. And I, I played it off. Heart prophetic. What a harbinger that would be of times to come. I'm not a violent man by any stretch of the imagination. If another man did to me, would drink it to me, I'd kill him with my bare hands. Alcohol. It'll take your job, your car, your wife, the shirt off your back. But what it really wants is me six feet under. There's a lot of terminal diseases out there, but this is one of the most terminal. If I hadn't have stopped drinking, drinking would have stopped me. And that's not some theory that I've come up with. That's just my experience here in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I had a bit more drinking to do. I'm the sort of an alcoholic. I've experienced it before my drinking. I was a weekend drinker, a daily drinker, morning drinking. I had my stomach, I was getting my stomach pumped out of 15 and 16 on school nights. I had a promising soccer career. George Best, one of the world famous soccer players, was from a couple of neighborhoods over. But the scouts stopped coming around. I blew that, kicked out of school at 16 on the scrap heap, drinking, 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 and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. But as I said earlier on, sobriety's progressive too. And as far down as you go with drink, you can come back up and maybe even then someone Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so glad the first night I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, they didn't have a clipboard because I would have checked the box for not drinking and would have been delighted with that. Once again, I would have shortchanged myself because I got so much more than that. Alcohol has only mentioned the first half of the first step. The other 11 and a half steps helped me to do something I couldn't do drunk or sober, and that's live out there in God's world under his conditions rather than my demands. Alcoholics Anonymous, like my book says, I do to dig two pitfalls. I would come in too high or I come in too low. What is alcoholism? For me, it was the inability to form true and lasting partnerships with me, with you, or with him. And because of the program of AA, it's a bridge back to life. And I've been able to do that. But you couldn't have told me that at 18 or 19 years of age. My life's falling apart. But I'm an alcoholic. I'm always looking for an outside fix for what's an inside job. I don't want to look in. I'm thinking to myself, poor me. I'm a working class Catholic from the wrong side of the tracks. This is during the troubles in Belfast. I can't get a break. Poor me, poor me. So what do I do? Always looking for that outside fix for what's really an inside job. And I said to myself, I come home to my father one night. And I said, sit down. I got some bad news for you. He says, what is it? I said, I'm going to America. And don't try and talk me out of it. He says, talk you out of it. I'll help you pack when you're leaving. <laughs> On you go, Columbus. Let me give you some fatherly advice. Turn left at Greenland, you know? <laughs> and like driftwood, I washed up in a place in New York called Rockaway Beach. Now, you call Rockaway Beach some of the old-timers in New York City. I don't mean people, just old-timers. to go to big Irish-American community. They go, oh, Rockaway Beach, the Irish Riviera. <laughs> It should have been called cirrhosis by the sea. They have more alcoholics. Per- it's amazing how the alcoholics got that built-in GPS system. You could have blindfolded me and put me in a sack. I ain't going to find a neighborhood that drinks as much, if not more, than the one I just left, you know? So I wash up on Rockaway Beach. Here I am going to make it big in America. And uh, I got a job as a bartender. Now, I'm using the word bar here in the loosest possible context. I worked in a bar. Perhaps you can identify I worked in a super bar. It was a super bar you got thrown into rather than out of, you know. You wiped your feet on the way out. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, this bar had it all. Alcoholics, drug addicts, degenerate gamblers. And that was just the staff. That wasn't even the customers, you know. <laughs> I'll give you a mental picture and then I'll move on. If you want to see a full set of teeth in this bar, you needed 32 customers. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this sort of place, you know. And this is male and female, you know. 
Maybe now and again a glamour girl with like three teeth would stumble into the place, you know, upset the whole ecosystem. Hey, baby, where have you been, you know? <laughs> but water finds its own level, and so do alcoholics, and I fit it in like a glove. There was guys there, I'm thinking to myself, and that's the story of my alcoholism. I would draw these, maybe you can identify, I would draw these lines in the sand, reach them, feel comfortable with them. If I ever drink in the morning, I was a morning drinker for years. If I ever lose work, lost many jobs. If I ended up in hospital, hospitalized a bunch of times. I would reach this level of drinking. I would just lower my standards and lower my standards and lower my standards. I'm in a job. I used to work at night from six at night to four in the morning, five nights a week. This is, this is actually quite pathetic. I worked in a job where I could go in behind the bar at quarter to six at night, pour myself a drink, put it in the speed rack, drink to four o'clock in the morning. At the end of my drinking, I couldn't even get there. My nerves were shot, couldn't ride the elevator, couldn't ride the subway, put my back against the wall. My fears had fears. Alcohol, a rebacious creditor, absolutely. And the worst years of my drinking... Here I am in America, I'm going to make it big. But now nah, nobody's saying, hey, Paul, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, when you have a drink in your hand? And like Bill Wilson says in his story, it's like going down a ski jump. I probably did in five years in New York what might have took 10 years back at home with all the cushions and the props. I went down hard and I went down fast. But the funny, the worst years of my drinking, 27 to 30, were after I made a firm conviction not to drink anymore. The worst years. I would do, like it says in chapter 3 in our book, I'm taking notes, making proclamations. I'll stop for Lent. I'll get back in shape. I'll do this and I'll do that. But you see, up until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had nothing between me and the first drink. You people give me something I never had. You give me something between me and the first drink. Like I said there tonight, three parts of the triangle, unity, service, and recovery, 12 steps. You hear people say, oh, you're just an arm's length away from a drink. I suppose so. I'm 12 steps away from a drink tonight. And that's a long, long way from when I first walked in. Don't get me wrong. They're not 12 steps up to anything. They're 12 steps down to humility. A friend of mine went drinking after a long period in AA. And he says, you know how you go back drinking in AA? You give those steps back one step at a time. Take your will back in three, become insane in two. So insane you tell yourself you're not an alcoholic or you don't cure and get drunk in the first step. As I said, I've seen people drinking AA that I thought would never drink again. I must earn the right to be sober on a daily basis. I got in here in a gift and the grace, the grace of God. And it's so much more than grace. I think of it as mercy. And the definition of mercy that I like is entering into the chaos of another person's life. In August of 1992, when everybody, and rightly so, was going this way, the only people coming this way was Alcoholics Anonymous. And they carried this message. My message might not even keep me sober. This message, when complete defeat through alcohol, step one, meets hope in human form, step 12, Recovery can and will begin. That's been my experience. From 27 to 30, as I said, I had nothing between me and the first drink. I've gotten to the ring many times. Up in this moment of time tonight, June 19th, I have never beaten an obsession to drink. And I've gotten to the ring many times. It's like getting in the ring with a heavyweight champion. A child could say, don't get in the ring. But don't get in the ring means don't take a drink. And I have nothing between me and the first drink. So what do I do? I get back in the ring. Perhaps you can identify. And I tell myself, the epitaph of the alcoholic, the dog of the drunk, it will be different this time. I'll watch it. It was her. It was him. It was this. It was that. I get back in the ring. I bob and I weave. But I take the first drink. One drink because the thirst I can't quench. I'm off to the races on the well-known spree that the doctor talks about. One more time. I'm laying flat on my back, looking up at the lights, saying, how did this happen again? And it was one more attempt at drinking, followed by one more failure at not drinking, followed by one more attempt at drinking ad infinitum. And the drunks just got longer in duration, and the period between them got shorter. I'll give you one vignette that just sums up. 
I almost went to the graveyard. I was a bartender. I went to the graveyard thinking, not knowing the difference between alcohol and alcoholism. Some of the heaviest drinkers I ever seen in my life were not alcoholic. That ISM and then that word separates me from the normal heavy drinker. Those people, and our book gives two examples, heavy drinkers, heavy drinkers, they can stop or moderate. They give two examples in the big book, a romantic reason or a medical reason. I'm different. That ISM on the end of that word separates me from the normal heavy drinker. My life doesn't get better when I stop drinking by myself. My life gets worse. I'll give you an example. I'm on a bad drunk one time. I mean a bad one. I ran out of drink in the house. I go to a bar to get drink. I collapsed in an alcoholic seizure. I had seizures before. Woke up in a restraining sheet in the hospital. I've been in restraining sheets before. They give me Librium to get me off the ceiling. And there's a woman by the bedside eventually who was very near and dear to me at that time in my life. They took the restraining cuffs off and I took her hand. And I wasn't trying to be cinematic. I took her hand and I says... I don't know why I can't drink, but it's obvious I can't drink. And that's it. I'm done. It's over. Finished. Complete. But the problem was I left that hospital. I didn't have unity. I didn't have service. I didn't have recovery. I didn't have 12 steps. I didn't have 12 traditions. I didn't know what the problem was, so I sure didn't know what the solution was. One more time, even with that, like, getting really battered by alcohol one more time was just me against the first drink. Here's what happens to me, because I have alcoholism. A drinking problem is solved by not drinking, but I have alcoholism. Here's what happens to me when I try to stop drinking without the help that I just spoke about. Here's what happens to me when I go toe-to-toe with this disease. A week goes by. I get this stone in my shoe. I don't know where it came from, but it's there all the time. Two weeks go by, I get a knot in my stomach. I don't know where it came from, but it's there all the time. Three weeks go by, the top button of my shirt feels tight all the time. A month goes by, if I get that far, it feels like everybody out there is on my case, even if they're not. That's 30 days without a drink. And I drank. That's not a drinking problem. That's a living sober problem. As a friend of mine says, when I sat at that bedside and I swore that I would never drink again. There's a dear friend of ours, says, Paul, if they'd have put you in a lie detector machine, you would have passed with flying colors. I meant that. I meant that at a deep, visceral level. That's it, I'm done. But I had nothing between me and the first drink. And as I said, up at this moment in time, I have never beaten an obsession to drink. And I drank again. And it says in our book, the alcoholic is the bewildered one. Nobody was any more confused than me. I couldn't believe I'm putting the drink to my lips. I couldn't believe I was drinking again. And that woman said what people say to alcoholics. I got to get away from you before I end up in the asylum. And I say what alcoholics say. I don't need you. I don't need nobody. And I like to tell you, I drank for a week. I drank for three more years after that. Bottoms to bottoms. And there's things that stick in your mind. I would go off the grid months at a time in New York City. My poor mother living back in Ireland would talk to other people in the neighborhood who had, who had family or relatives in New York and say, can you ask your brother, has he seen my son? I remember one time she tracked me down. Here's a guy that was going to make it big in America. I'm living on a concrete floor and a basement and, a, and an apartment in the Bronx. It's Christmas Eve. There's a phone that just takes incoming calls. The phone rang. It was my mother. And with a five-hour time difference, she had been to Midnight Mass back in Ireland. And she says, I went to Midnight Mass tonight, and I prayed for you. And I'm thinking, don't pray for me. I'm beyond the beyond. I ain't coming back. I'm dumb, but I'm not stupid. I hung up the phone. I'd like to tell you that I walked out in it. Some Frank Capra Christmas Eve, it's a wonderful life moment, but I didn't. I drank on and I drank on and I drank on. I'm here tonight. Like I said, Bill went looking for Dr. Bob. I'm here because someone came looking for me. I'm here as a recipient of a 12-step call in Alcoholics Anonymous. Two men took time out of their busy lives to give me a life. I'm in an apartment drinking around the clock. 
I used to have seizures coming off drink. Now I'm even having them while I'm drinking. I'd lock myself in the room, go out around the clock. Every waking moment I'd be drunk, drunk three or four times a day. I'm in this room. I haven't eaten in about 10 or 12 days. I'm out of my mind. I would think to myself, my mother, I'd look at, it was Rockaway Beach, and I'd think of my mother and father 3,000 miles away in Ireland. I'm thinking I'll never see them again. Bill Wilson sums it up better than anybody heard. Like I said earlier, quicksand stretched all around him. But he also said something I can identify. He says, it's darkness before the dawn. A woman who was very close to me with this on again, off again relationship. I mean, it's a miracle. She's at work. And nobody had seen me for like a week or 10 days. And she broke down crying at her desk. And a woman who had just started with the company says, why is that woman crying? And someone said, she's got this boyfriend, bad drinker. Nobody's seen him for about a week. They might have to break the door down. She goes, my father's got a friend who's in this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you want me to get his number? When God's involved, there are no barriers. They just disintegrate. We're all miracles here. What is a miracle? a complete reversal or upheaval of the laws of nature. Beyond the realm of human engineering, a phone call was made. I'm in the apartment and a note came under the door. And I picked up this note and it said what I've been hearing since I was 15. You're a nice guy, but you drink too much. And a man's telephone number on it. I can help you. And I picked up the phone against my better judgment. Everything that's helped me in AA has been against my better judgment. (laughs) I picked up the phone. I called a complete stranger, and he had been praying that I might call. I said, I can't stop drinking. I can't stop drinking. He said, you can't stop drinking because you're an alcoholic. He says, me and another guy is coming over to your house. He says, and he said a funny thing. He said, do you believe in God? I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, I got Billy Graham coming over to the house, you know. (laughs) Jesus Christ. I was going to ask to pick up a court on the way over, but I guess that's out of the question, you know. <laughs> and it's funny that he said that because I grew up in Northern Ireland where people shot each other outside the front door over who the biggest God. We were burnt out of our house in the middle of the night by the opposing power and militaries because we were Catholic. I was seven years of age. I heard a rat tat tat one night, looked out one day, opened the door, there was two, two soldiers lying dead on the front doorstep. He used to talk about God. I thought it was very slick when I was older. I said, God, <laughs> he never came down our street very often. And I thought that was very slick and bohemian. But desperate times call for desperate measures. And when you're out of options, I was a man without a plan. I was out of options. I had nothing left. Everything was gone. And against my better judgment, I got down on my knees and I said the alcoholic prayer. I've heard it many times. And I love to hear that part in somebody's story because you hear they're going down and they're going down and you're going down and then you hear that moment in someone's story when they go, and then. And you know God's coming in the next sentence or somebody, God, working through people because people get people sober. God works through people. That's been my experience. And like a hot August morning, but it was a cry in the dark. I said that alcoholic prayer, if there's anything out there, please help me. And I felt like someone walked up behind me and took a great weight off my shoulders. A sense of peace came over me that I've I've never experienced before since. I started to worry and fret, but this other feeling kept suppressing it. The two guys came to the door. I told them what I just told you. He says, Paul, you're the spiritual experience. It'll get you sober, but it won't keep you sober. We've got to get you to Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, I had one of those in a straitjacket in 1960 in Mount Carmel McGill. And they brought us too sick to go to a meeting that day. But three days later, I was physically strong enough to walk out of the house and go to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And walking into a meeting of AA is one of the greatest singular events in my life. Because unbeknownst to myself, I moved from the problem to the solution. Someone met me after my first meeting, and they asked me. I intuitively knew there was something here. I couldn't have described it. I couldn't have articulated it. I couldn't have written it down. But something told me, spirit, recognizing spirit, something told me there was something here. There was something here in this room. And little did I know only the half of it. 
What does Einstein say? A problem cannot be solved at the same level of consciousness that created the problem. Use people. Help me move to a different level of consciousness by giving me that help and bring me through that program. I would like to tell you that I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and I took the ball and scored a touchdown, but I didn't. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. Our book says, let go absolutely of all your old ideas, and I wouldn't do that. I came in here with barroom mentality. And I thought to myself, I was going to meetings, probably the three parts of the triangle, I was going to meetings, I was doing service. I remember saying to the guy, I'm making more coffee than Juan Valdez. Are you kidding me, service? <laughs> but I wouldn't do door number three. I wouldn't do the third part of the triangle. I wouldn't do recovery. I looked at this toast, typical Irish, stoic, don't tell nobody nothing. That was my code of conduct. I looked at these steps and I thought they were very touchy, very feely, very warm and fuzzy. I said, do these steps. The next thing, I'll have wind chimes hanging up around the house, you know. <laughs> I'd be like wearing flip-flops even in the wintertime, you know. <laughs> Join an Oprah's book club. Where does it all end, you know? And you can fool them with the coffee pot at 7.30. I've done it. How's it going, Paul? Oh, it's going great. But you know when alcoholism comes to visit me? 2.30 in the morning. Could'ves, should'ves, would'ves, guilt, shame, remorse, shackled to self, me on me. That's when alcoholism comes to visit me. Another sleepless night in sobriety. Two and a half years off drink, thousands upon thousands of dollars in debt because I'm looking for the vital spurs to experience everywhere but except the place where it is in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had to bottom out. I have to wait till the dogs are right here. That's the sort of a guy I am. I'm two and a half years sober. I say my life's unmanageable. I'm still bartending. And I uh, come out of the... Uh, it's sad, but I come out of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel onto the Gowanus Expressway. It's a six-lane highway, and a guy cut me off. This is two and a half years off drink. A guy cut me off. I shot after him. I jammed him in against the guardrail. This is on a six-lane highway. I didn't care who was behind. It could have been Tony Soprano behind the wheel. I didn't care. I'm out of my mind. I go to the car. There was an Asian gentleman shaking behind the wheel. His wife's crying, and his three kids are crying in the back of the car. I was disgusted with myself. I apologized profusely. I got back in my own car. I banged my head against the steering wheel. I said, I'm crazier off drink than I was on it. I drove to my sponsor's house. I called him my sponsor, but I wasn't using him. I drove to his house and I told him what I just told you. He sits back and he goes, how old were you when this happened? I'm... <laughs> I'm like, are you listening to me? It happened 20 minutes ago. What do you mean, how old when I went to... Maybe this is why I can't get sober. You're not listening, you know? He said, last year again, how old were you when this happened? And he told that phrase, Harry T. about the psychiatrist that had Bill Wilson coined that phrase, which sums up me, His Majesty the Baby. I want what I want, and I want it right now. I am trying to enjoy all the benefits of being sober without doing the program, and it's just, not, it's just not happening. So against my better judgment, once again, everything that's helped me is against my better judgment. And I fought this program. I would go through those first three steps, and I'm not going to go into all the steps, but I would go through those first three steps. <clears throat> but it says in our literature, some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. Step four was that for me. I was carrying stuff around. I'm an alcoholic now with two hefty bags full of garbage. I'm carrying stuff around from the schoolyard. And I'm defending it. I'm justifying it. I'm rationalizing it. I viewed the life I had. And if I tell somebody out there the life that I grew up in, they say, Paul, that's terrible. But an alcoholic now says, Paul, it doesn't matter. You've got to get free. I'm from Northern Ireland. I grew up during the Troubles. We marched in the streets for freedom. We fought for freedom. We sang about freedom. We talked about freedom. I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't know freedom would have jumped up beside me. I'm free tonight. 
I'm as free as any time I've been in my life. It mightn't seem like much to get in a car in New York City and drive to Maryland, but that's a sense of freedom I didn't have before I came here. Alcohol was a common denominator in my life. Alcohol made every decision was divided through alcohol at least once. I don't care if I'm going here to that door. There's enough drink to get me there. Enough when I get there, enough to get me back. And when you live your life under those parameters, your life gets smaller and smaller with less people in it. And I was doing that in AA without drink. I was atrophying spiritually in AA. Mother Teresa says, even God can't fill a cup that's already full. I'm full up to here with self. I got to get something out to let something in. Nothing beats a feeder but a try, and all they ever asked me to do was try. And I fought this, and I fought this, and finally, bottomed out two and a half years, I said, that, that thing, that road rage thing, and against my better judgment, I said to myself, I got I to gotta put pen, my sponsor's like, you got to put pen to paper. You got to let this stuff go, Paul. I'm thinking to myself, I fought this footstep for so long, and then I'm such an alcoholic. I said... They want me to do a fourth step. I'm going to do the best fourth step that anybody's ever done in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I wanted my sponsor to stand up at the meeting and go, I just want the group to know that Paul, <laughs> who I am honored to call my sponsee, <laughs> recently presented me with the hamlet of fourth steps. <laughs> I cried, I laughed, I cried two thumbs way up, you know? And my sponsor's like, he's been there for a long time. He says, Paul, it's like driving to Florida. The big book will give us explicit directions. We follow this book. We'll not get lost. Just like driving to Florida over the Delaware Memorial Bridge, 95. Can't get lost. The 12 and 12, let's take it as a spiritual guidebook. It might tell you what you see along the way. Those two books together, we'll be fine. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but he's been sober since 1960. I got, like, modern defects of character, you know? <laughs> I find out the defects I have been around since the garden, but that's a story for another day, you know? So I entered the world, please, this is my own experience, I entered the world of the footstep guide. I had every footstep guide that was ever printed. Footstep guides for men, footstep guides for Irish men who lived outside of Belfast. <laughs> I'd one footstep guide at a hundred questions, ninety-nine of which had no reason why I drank in the first place. <laughs> Forget about getting a piece of paper and a pen. I'm turning my apartment into what can only be described as like a spiritual nerve center. I got like flip charts, magic markers, highlighters, I got pots of coffee going. <laughs> There's a friend of ours used to say, you know what you're like? You're like a dog running on linoleum. A lot of activity, but no progress. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm the phone off the hook. My sponsor's shouting up. I live on the first floor. Hey, how's that fourth step coming? I'm like, it's coming. How am I going to know you get your phone off the hook? How am I going to know when it's finished? Would there be like a puff of white smoke like when you elect a new pope? <laughs> like, oh, the fourth step's been completed. And there was joy throughout the land, you know. <laughs> and I live overlooking the beach in Rockaway, and I have another spiritual wake. I says, hey, why am I sitting in the apartment here? I should be down on the beach looking at that special place where the sea meets the sky and drawing inspiration from that. So I slimmed down the operation and took it down to the boardwalk, you know. So now I'm sitting there in the boardwalk with my legal pad, my big blank legal pad, you know. And I'm still into aesthetics, like, you know, I'm sitting there trying to draw the columns really, really straight, you know. I'm stopping strangers, excuse me, do these columns look perpendicular to you, you know? They're like, those are wonderful, who's your sponsor, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know? <laughs> and then my sponsor catches up with me, he goes, what do you think, you're like Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, you know? All joking aside, there's a guy who's passed away, and I used to say, you could, the fourth step takes as long as it takes in one night. And it's just a step. There's no one-trick ponies in here. It's a 12-step program, and I need all 12 of them. 
But that turn, it was like a watershed moment for me. I put that down. And you look at steps four through nine. In four, I wrote. In five, I talked. In six, I wrote. In seven, I talked. In eight, I wrote. In nine, I talked. Preparation followed by action. Preparation followed by action. Preparation followed by action. That's how normal people operate. And I needed to do the same. And I put this stitch down. And I got free from the one guy I couldn't get free from. I remember saying to my sponsor, those people that burnt us out of our house, they were mass men. He said, put them down on paper and forgive them to be free. Emmett Fox says, it takes two to make a jail, the prisoners and the jailer. And I had all these people up here in this mental prison. And just like regular prison, every day you got to do roll call of why they're there and what they did to you and replay and regurgitate and all the spiritual toxicity that that releases into your life. It was only I opened the door of the jail and let them go free that I got to go free too. So I put this stuff down on paper. But I'll tell you something. Is it nice to do the steps to get a full knowledge of your condition? I suppose so. Like, you know, I used to think, oh, I'm working on me and I'm working on me. But you know when my life really caught on fire? You know when my life took on new meaning? You know when great events came to pass in my life? Is when I turned around and I took another man through the steps. That's when this program came full circle. And you see somebody stand at your door with a piece of paper under their arm and you help them get free for the first time in many, many years, perhaps their whole lives. We have a blessing here. We have an ability here to help people on a daily basis. If my problem is self, I get the opportunity to work every day with helping other alcoholics. And then I'm going to stand up here and tell you everything in AA. You know, life goes on. Life is up and life is down. When it's like this, like the heart machine, you're dead. But I can live life on life's terms today. I have a wonderful life in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just a few things that end up, I'll end up on this. I come into AA at 30 years of age. I didn't even have a high school diploma. I was 32 years of age, still bartending. And my sponsor said, well, why don't you go back to school? Or in your case, why don't you go to school for the first time, you know? And uh, I said, you know, typical alcoholic. I said, I can't do that. He said, what do you mean you can't do it? What do we ask? Nothing but your feet but a try. And I said, Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to do, to take on long-term goals and chip away at them one day at a time. See, I'm always looking for the quick fix. That's why I loved alcohol. I hadn't even swallowed the stuff. I was somebody else, someplace else. Alcoholics Anonymous told me to go for the long haul rather than the quick fix, to take on long-term goals, whether it be sobriety, peace of mind, or even education or a job. And I went to school and I loved it. And I got a degree and got another one, two graduate degrees, became a teacher, wanted to teach the brightest of the bright, did that for a while, and then got at other plans and got me, I work in special education. And it's the greatest gift in my life. I go to children's houses that can't get to school and I work with them one-on-one. A gift keeps me out of self. I go into somebody's house with my Mickey Mouse problems and I see some young child who will not graduate excited about learning, excited that I'm there. I constantly need that cosmic two-by-four across the back of the head to wake me up to what's really important. Paul, you know what? You're a hopeless drunkard, and you're sitting here sober today, and you got a life beyond your wildest dreams. Catch a grip. And I need to be constantly reminded of that. Things that have happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, I bartended the first 12 years, I bartended the last five years drinking, and I bartended the first 12 years in AA, I don't do that anymore. And uh, I became a father in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got married and divorced in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a daughter who's uh, 10 years of age. Now, I wanted to be those things. But before I became a sober man, my name wasn't worth the papers written on. But you people showed me how to be responsible, how to be accountable, how to be dependable, how to show up. I love that about myself. Can you come to Maryland? Yes, I can come to Maryland. Unless something happens, I'm here. My name was worth nothing before I came here. Now I have a, a, my word means something today. And the work with these children, my daughter, it's just a blessing. And, and things happen. There's a funny story, and I'll, and I'll end on this here. That reminds me of the day at a time. I was sober 15 years, and we're moving house. And uh, I was in an apartment. I was just given the keys over the next day. There was nothing. I mean, literally nothing in the apartment. I was just handing the keys over. 
the next day. So I'm sleeping on a blow-up mattress by myself, 15 years sober, in the middle of the night. I had a, had a heart attack. Now, let me give you a word of advice. If you ever want to have a heart attack, do not have it on a blow-up mattress. All right? I'm rolling it back like, back like a boated fish. I can't get out of the mattress. I'm such an alcoholic. The phone's right there. But for some reason, I wanted to see what I looked like, you know? And uh, <laughs> I crawl past the phone down to the bathroom, and I pull myself up. Like, Jeez, I look terrible, you know? Slide back down again. Then I go back to the phone. I call 911. They bring me to the local hospital. They're like, no, you got to take him to Long Island Jewish. They've got a 24-hour team on standby. Now, why am I telling you? I get to the Long Island Jewish. They've got a crash team waiting there. They're asking you all these questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, what's the pain like? Uh, is somebody here with you? I see a cross around your neck. Are you a Catholic? I'm like, why is it better from Jewish? You know, and uh, <laughs> typical alcohol, I keep all my options open, you know? Like, the surgeon is like, hoy ve, can you believe this is happening to me, you know? What would my mama say, you know? And, uh, and the, the point of the story is I flatlined on the table. I'm dead for three or four minutes, have the whole after-death experience to bring me back to life. Turns out I had a problem since birth that I didn't know about. I was a walking time bomb. But they get me out and put some hardware in so it doesn't happen again. Point being, I leave that hospital, and I'm telling anybody that will listen. There wasn't many, but those that would listen, I'm saying, you're looking at the new me. Between the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and having this after-death experience, this close call, I'm not going to get annoyed anymore in the supermarket. I'm not going to get annoyed anymore with the simple stuff. And for about a week, I was like the Dalai Lama of Long Island, you know? <laughs> Somebody had cut me off. I'd be like, peace be with you, my brother. <laughs> I'm in no hurry. I'm living in eternity. I've been to the other side. This is really not all that important, you know. <laughs> but you miss a few meetings. You don't talk to your sponsor. And even something as deep and profound as a 12-step program or not, alcoholism will run right over the top of that. So that tells me that the only way that I coast an alcoholic's name is downhill. And I got to come here to be with you people. There's an Irish guy called Matt Talbot. Maybe you've heard of him who stopped drinking. He died in 1925. He stopped drinking through a spiritual experience and taking the pledge and devoting himself to helping people. And many people go to much trouble retreats and whatnot. But he said before he died, he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said an alcoholic giving up drinking is like bringing the, bringing the dead back to life. It's not impossible. But with God, both these things are possible. And I think of myself, an alcoholic like myself, and I've come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I will report back to New York that I have seen the dead walk again. I have seen people that were hopeless have hope. And only those things that I have seen, I get a front row seat for the very best that humanity has to offer. I need you, and you need me. If I'm doing AA alone, I'm not doing AA. Which a friend of mine says, it's BB. I said, what's BB? He said, I don't know, but it's not AA, you know? <laughs> and I'll end on a few other words from Ireland, and we'll end this meeting tonight. There's two things that are near and dear to me in alcohol in this world. It's AA and Ireland, and perhaps this sums up both of them. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 